why did the Soviet Union collapse? Was it because of Ronald Reagan or was it much more complicated than that? And what lessons does the collapse of the Soviet Union have for us today? How does it help explain what's happening in the world today, including the conflict in Ukraine? There is a fabulous book that I'm going to review today on the channel by Vladislav Zubok called Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union that has answers to all these questions. Let's have a look at it. Uh, if you're new here, I'm Jeff Rich and this is the Burning Archive YouTube channel. I do uh, videos and podcasts about the history and politics of the multipolar world. So give the video a like and subscribe and you'll get lots of great new content from me. So in October 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and Ronald Reagan met at Reykjavik in Iceland and uh, negotiated one of the most significant arms reduction deals in history. It brought an end to the arms race between the Soviet Union and America, led, uh, precipitated really, by Ronald Reagan's Star Wars initiative in the uh, early 1980s. And Gorbachev was a hero to many in the West. He uh, and and in his own country, he appeared to be uh, the great statesman of the 1980s. He had begun a process of democratisation and economic reform and political liberalisation in the Soviet Union. Glasnost, perestroika, and a new international order of peace and cooperation – the world and the Soviet Union appeared to be entering a new phase. But just five years after that summit in Reykjavik, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, it crumbled in a catastrophic political and social collapse, an economic collapse. And when it collapsed, it was not just one country. It was the idea, almost, of a different kind of political order in the world. The Soviet Union was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It was an alternative to Western uh, capitalist democracy. So why did the Soviet Union collapse? Did America defeat uh, the USSR in the Cold War? Did the USSR lose because it became bogged down militarily in Afghanistan? Did they collapse because of the inherent weaknesses of uh, their political cultures in Russia and Ukraine and the Eurasian states? Did they collapse because of inherent... Uh, did they collapse because the CIA was uh, manipulating events behind the scenes or because Russia and the Soviet Union was an evil communist empire? How does this story actually inform events in Russia and Ukraine today? Does the collapse of the Soviet Union even contain a warning for the United States of America? And all these questions are addressed in, in Vladislav Zubok's book, the Collapse, uh, the Collapse of the Soviet Union, that was published in late 2021. Uh, it was published on the cusp of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it is both a timely and untimely meditation on really the biggest geopolitical event of my lifetime. Uh, the USSR was a country of roughly 300 million people on a par with the United States of America, and it stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, the USA for, um, well, since 1945 to 1989, so 40 
five years, 50 years, really. And it occupied one sixth of the world's land uh, mass. Extraordinary. And it's hard to imagine, reimagine, if you like, the importance of the Soviet Union in, uh, I guess, the cultural world of so many. Uh, uh, not so, perhaps so much in America, but certainly in other parts of the world, the the cultural significance of the Soviet Union as uh, the rival to the United States and an alternative vision, uh, the the land of socialism, so to speak. It was impossible to cancel the Soviet Union, but in the end, the Soviet Union collapsed. And it collapsed amidst terrible suffering amongst its people. Uh, somewhere like for some time in the 1990s, you know, 70% of uh, Russians lived in poverty. And places like Ukraine have actually never really recovered from the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Uh, so that's why... This event, the collapse of the Soviet Union, I say, was the biggest geopolitical event of my lifetime. Zubok's book is a timely meditation because it directly informs events in the emerging multipolar world today and specifically events in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, there's the central issue of the eastward expansion of NATO and the promises made by the United States to the Soviet leaders that they would not expand NATO. That's covered in Zubok's book, and it is a central issue in the war. Uh, there's the question of what really are the borders of Ukraine and how well were they uh, settled and negotiated when Ukraine formed as an independent state in uh, you know, at the end of 1991. Should Donbass and Crimea and Nova Russia go to Ukraine? Or to Russia, and those issues were in dispute in the midst of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it is also a timely meditation because no less a figure than Vladimir Putin, President of Russia, has made a comparison between the historic collapse of the Soviet Union and the prospective collapse of the United States. In mid-2022, he commented that the problem of empire is that they think they are so powerful that they can afford small inaccuracies and mistakes. But problems keep piling up, and at some point, they are no longer able to cope with them. And the United States is now walking the Soviet Union's path and its gait is confident and steady. It's confidently, steadily walking towards collapse. Well... I'm not saying that view is correct, but it is a view. And if you read Vladislav Zubok's Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union, you'll be able to make up your own mind as to whether that is a uh, correct comparison. Empires, great states and political orders do sometimes collapse. Rarely, and it's rarely in predictable ways. So could the long-predicted decline and fall of the U.S. empire be in reach and be understood better by looking at the collapse of its longtime rival, the Soviet Union. But Zubok's book is also an untimely meditation because the events of the Russia-Ukraine war, which have been going on in the months after the publication of his book, uh, and the general climate uh, of uh, opinion uh, and, let's say, intolerance around that war have perhaps uh, meant that the attention 
uh, that his book deserves has really not gone to the book. Uh, we've had something of a history war about Russia, the Soviet Union and the Cold War and the United States role with the uh, eastward expansion of NATO. And as a result, I suspect this uh, important book, this really important book, uh, has not received the attention it deserved. It was nominated for, I think, the Kundal History Prize. And it was also shortlisted for the Pushkin House uh, History Prize, but it didn't win those prizes. But it certainly uh, was uh, honoured amongst other leading historians. And while there are a few video appearances and discussions in which Professor Zubok discusses his book, it hasn't really, I think, uh, captured the uh, attention uh, that it really deserves because this is a profoundly important book, a profoundly well-written book and a, a book from which I think everyone can learn uh, an enormous amount because myths and stories and uh, narratives about the collapse of the Soviet Union very much inform the ideas and policies and strategies and events that are occurring today in the emerging multipolar world. So let me give you five top reasons that uh, reading this book will benefit you. Well, the first thing is it is an absolutely epic story and uh, you may... Uh, 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 it's it's a story I sort of lived through, um, you know, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s and have had, you know, sort of Im like uh, partial memories of for decades. Uh, but it was a really quite moving experience to go through the full story, not just in fragments from television but the full, well-documented story of this extraordinary series of events, the rapid rise to power, or perhaps the sudden rise to power of Mikhail Gorbachev in the mid-1980s, his, his, uh, the blossoming of hope for reform in the Soviet Union, and the not only that, the, the blossoming of hope for peace and disarmament around the world, uh, the end to Star Wars, the end to nuclear disarmament, extraordinary sudden collapse of the Berlin Wall in, the 19, in 1989, and then the almost, uh, as that apparent triumph washed away, the, the sudden implode, what appeared to be sudden and strange implosion of support for Gorbachev within uh, Russia or the Soviet Union and its break up. Uh, the coup, there was a coup against Gorbachev in August 1991 and the rise to power of his great rival Boris Yeltsin and uh, the the hopes of the liberal democratic reformers, the emergence of apparent hardliners, the constant speculation about military coups and uh, the involvement of Americans in both propaganda and espionage activities, and then ultimately the disintegration of the Soviet Union in late 1991. Uh, so it's a totally extraordinary, epic and tragic story that it's really well worth everyone uh, coming to terms with because it's far more, it gives you a much richer sense of what really happened in the world between 1980 and 1992 than, um, you know, Ronald Reagan going to Berlin and saying, Mr Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Ronald Reagan really did not defeat the Soviet Union. 
So the second great reason to explore this is the book itself uh, as a history book is a brilliantly told history. Uh, It's superbly written, sort of plainly written, given the vast complexity of affairs. It's... uh, It's actually a riveting read. It's almost a page turner. And it's told with real dramatic flair. You actually get a sense of all the voices of the different characters involved. You get a sense of the personalities, the strengths and the weaknesses and the idiosyncrasies of Gorbachev and Yeltsin and a whole series of other characters who are actually really crucial to events, even though they've sort of faded from historical memory, at least in the West. And uh, you also get a sense in which uh, those characters and their individual decisions and their style of decision-making had a decisive, crucial impact on events as well. This is not just a story of big social forces changing things. It's, it's, uh, it's a story of dramatic moments and deep emotions and passions. The extraordinary scene of Gorbachev and his wife responding differently to their uh, capture in a Crimean, um, uh, Crimean sort of beach house uh, during the August 1991 coup, the moving moment when uh, Gorbachev is about to finally step down as president of the Soviet Union and is sitting in tears on a couch in the Kremlin. So it, it's, a, it's a beautifully written, dramatically written, uh, wonderful book where you get a real sense of individual agency influencing historical events, as well as this uh, wonderfully drawn set of characters more than just Gorbachev and Reagan. Then the third great reason to read this book is that it really pushes against historical myths about the Soviet collapse. I've mentioned before the whole idea that Ronald Reagan went to Berlin and said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this war. And what happened? It all fell apart. No, it was a much more complicated set of events than that. And it was also not in any way an inevitable sense of events as well. It's something where the decisions of Gorbachev and the decisions of Yeltsin, uh, as well as the decisions of the Americans and the European leaders, meant that one path was followed rather than another. And uh, the uh, all, all that possible solutions were overlooked and blocked. It may well have been quite feasible for the Soviet Union to have endured and even perhaps reformed itself in the way that I guess China did with the um, uh, uh, one party state state capitalist system that uh, really sort of emerged after the 1980s. So uh, he also really tackles the various myths about the collapse of the Soviet Union being driven by its involvement in Afghanistan, an idea that perhaps still has a regrettable resonance within American foreign policy circles. And it looks in detail at the uh, perhaps the economic and the governance reasons for the collapse. He says that uh, the Soviet Union fell victim to a perfect storm and a hapless captain. In the 1980s, after 15 years of resisting any reforms, the Soviet leadership under Mikhail Gorbachev launched economic and political changes of great magnitude. The ideas and designs underpinning those reforms were, however, fatally outdated economically flawed and led to 
to the destruction of the existing economy and polity from within. The architects of the reforms, above all Mikhail Gorbachev, were unable to recognise their failure and modify their course. At the same time, they enabled new actors to emerge from the rubble of the old system who were to inherit the chaos. Brilliant book. So the fourth great uh, reason, uh, fourth great benefit, is it provides an extraordinary realist view, I guess, about political leaders, the multipolar world, uh, and political order. Uh, there's no idealization of Gorbachev. There's no idealization of Reagan or Bush or American democratic ideals. It is. Uh, it it is, in a way, a quite tragic vision because it it looks at how misperceptions of events drove bad decisions in events. It shows how how I guess difficult it really is to govern large states like uh, the Soviet Union or the United States of America and to do so with coherence, to really understand those kind of changes and then to implement reforms. And it's also a very realistic view of the tensions and the difficulties in the relationships between uh, uh, Russia and the former Soviet republics like Ukraine and Georgia and Belarus, uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan and all the others. That realistic understanding of politics and political order and political leaders uh, helps uh, prevent the, uh, you know, idealize. We we often, when we look at historical events, want to imagine the great leader can somehow get on top of the chaos of events and just um, turn it in the way that they want. But that is so often simply not possible. And Zubok, I think, has written an absolute masterpiece in terms of a realistic, tragic vision of um, politics, I guess. And then the fifth reason, I think, especially for people who are interested in the emergence of the multipolar world and the events of today, is that you will learn a lot about American diplomacy in this book too. Um, there are all sorts of figures who uh, appear uh, in this book who are still prominent in the debate uh, today. Uh, you'll hear, you'll find out about Michael McFall, the former uh, amb American ambassador to Russia, who is amongst some of the most extreme um uh, has some of the most extreme opinions on on uh, America wanting to defeat and organise regime change in Russia. You'll find out about Graham Allison, the author of the Thucydides Traps, who, much to my surprise, was one of the key uh, architects of a plan for a sort of a second Marshall plan for... A, uh, a partnership between the Soviet Union and the United States of America that could have uh, potentially avoided collapse. And you'll find out so much about the internal divisions within the Bush administration between its sort of Secretary of State, James Baker, and the economic hardheads and the uh, more um, aggressive neoconservative types about what to do with the Soviet Union should they um, work with Mikhail Gorbachev to sort of support their democratic reforms and uh, enable uh, a successful transition to a sort of market economy in the Soviet Union or should they you kick the Soviet Union when it's down, most regrettably. And some of these passages, I think, in the book, you know, really are 
quite moving. Most regrettably, uh, the Americans chose to kick their enemy when it was down. So, uh, yeah, you'll learn a lot about uh, <laughs> some of the governing ideas of American diplomacy, some of the uh, some of the institutional weaknesses of American diplomacy and some of the regrettable history of American diplomacy through this book as well. So do read Vladislav Zubok's uh, Collapse, The Fall of the Soviet Union. I won't give too many spoilers about the book because it is an, it's absolutely a brilliant read and I really recommend people read it. It's, it's a, it's it not well. It's not an easy read, but as I say, it's really quite a thrilling, direct, well written book. Uh, and if you do read it, you will understand uh, events better. And you might also think about that question that Vladimir Putin posed of whether America is following the. Uh, path of the Soviet Union? Is it walking confidently and steadily towards collapse like the Soviet Union? There are indeed signs. Maybe America is overextended militarily. Maybe America is experiencing a similar kind of financial uh, crisis in its system. It has a serious budget crisis. It has a serious ideological crisis. Its life expectancy is going south to one of the early signs of collapse in the Soviet Union, and its leadership class is certainly uh, uh, perhaps reaching the limits of its capability. If I and this question uh, posed by Vladimir uh, Putin is also posed by. Vladislav Zubok at the end of the book. And he comments, the human mind cannot envision long-term changes. Who could imagine in 1991 that China, ruled by the Communist Party and virtually isolated after the violent crackdown on Tiananmen Square, would become the second and potentially first economic power in the world? Who could predict in the early 1990s that commentators three decades later would be discussing a new crisis of the global liberal order, the decline of US power and pervasive Euro scepticism. Few doubt today, however, that the era of widespread faith in an invincible liberal democracy is over. In the last decade, populism has reared its head again to challenge the old order, this time against liberalism in the American heartland and in Eastern Europe. Most would indignantly refute any parallel between the Soviet collapse and recent developments in the West. Yet, some former Soviets experienced sudden frissons of recognition. So he talks about the bailout in 2008, and now, I guess, the bailouts in 2023. He talks about how Barack Obama, despite his grand rhetoric, never took, never closed Guantanamo Bay, never got out of Afghanistan ended up in disasters in Libya and Syria. He talks about how uh, the Brexit refer referendum was a supposed solution that generated a new larger problem and how uh, Donald Trump's Make America Great rhetoric is a new form of Boris Yeltsin's victimisation of Russia rhetoric. Uh, he says, history has never been a morality play about the inevitable victory of freedom and democracy. Instead, the world remains what it always was, an arena of struggle 
between idealism and power, good governance and corruption, the surge of freedom and the need to curb it in times of crisis and emergency. The ghost of the disappeared Soviet Union does not stalk Europe, Asia and the world. Yet the puzzle of its sudden disappearance still haunts haunts the imagination of contemporaries, particularly as they see the certainties of the previously triumphant Western liberal order shaking and eroding under their feet. The end of the Soviet Union was a human drama of historic magnitude and epic uncertainty. It cannot be reduced to a footnote in the global narrative of the Cold War's end, decolonisation and liberal capitalism. This amazing story teaches us not to trust in the seeming certainty of continuity and should help us prepare for sudden shocks in the future. And that is a brilliant summary of this great book, this great tragic realist vision of history, this um, moving account from someone who himself directly lived through these events, Vladislav Zubok, and a brilliant lesson, uh, a brilliant example of how thinking carefully about the different stories we tell each other about the past can help us see the world as it is today more clearly and open up new paths of action for us, how we perhaps cannot walk firmly and steadily towards collapse. If you like this video, do leave us a like and subscribe to the channel. And you can also check out my Substack at jeffrich, J-E-F-F-R-I-C-H dot substack dot com. And, and if you like, if you think that the US, if you agree or disagree with the idea that the United States of America could collapse like the Soviet Union, why don't you leave us a comment below and give us your reasons and I might respond to them in a subsequent video. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you on the channel again soon.